www.greatmoneyradio.com. I'm Craig Lamolt. Tonight on Greater Boston, we're talking about food. First, food security. With a pandemic-era expansion of SNAP benefits officially expired for hundreds of thousands of Massachusetts residents, where does this leave families already struggling to put food on the table? And what can the state do to help? Then later, what makes foods healthy? The FDA is moving to change the definition to exclude products that are high in salt, sugar, and saturated fat, and low in nutrients. But dozens of food manufacturers are fighting back. For families across the country and across Massachusetts, putting food on the table could soon get even harder. Since March of 2020, when pandemic-related closures and layoffs rocked the economy, more than 600,000 Massachusetts families have relied on emergency expansion of SNAP, formerly known as food stamps, which allowed them to receive maximum benefits through the program. That is until four days ago, when the expansion expired, leaving families in this state with around $150 less per month at a time when inflation has sent food prices even higher and made historically affordable staples like eggs seem like a luxury. So what options do those families have now? Joining me now to discuss are State Senator Sal DiDomenico, Assistant, uh, Senate Majority, excuse me, Assistant Senate Majority Leader and Co-Chair of the Massachusetts Food System Caucus, and Catherine Lynn, Vice President for Communications for the Greater Boston Food Bank. Thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. S- Senator DiDomenico, let's start with you. Can you tell me about the change that happened uh, during the pandemic, uh, the boost in these benefits, and, and how significant that was? Yeah, this, this was a lifeline from families, uh, particularly uh, in my district and across the state. Uh, the additional SNAP benefits really allow them to not to make as much, many tough choices between food, medical costs, rent, and making sure that they get you know, fresh produce into the homes of many of these folks that have uh, lived without that prior to that. The pandemic caused a wide range of issues, but only exacerbated the problems in the areas that we need to help the most. And that's why this was such an important piece of legislation that came through the federal government to expand SNAP benefits, because um, there was no other way to offset that cost. The, the gaps grew wider and wider for many families across that Commonwealth, and this was able to, to bridge that gap. Catherine, as we said, it's a, it's a drop of about $150 a month for family on average. How much is that going to be felt? It's going to be huge for families and individuals across the state and across the nation. Um, and food banks are bracing themselves for that impact to take um, to take the or they're going to take the brunt of of um, of trying to fill that gap that that this benefit had filled for the last couple of years. And there's been historic enrollment in SNAP here in Massachusetts. We know that oftentimes uh, a lot of those individuals are also seeing uh, going to a pantry to supplement, you know, all the needs. And it's we're, we're really worried that um, you know our programs that are already experiencing a lot of high demand are going to see even more. How significant is the rise in food prices for families right now and, and the combination of, of this reduction with those, those prices being at historic highs? Yeah, this is the, the perfect storm, right? So inflation being what it is today and, you know, we've had cash assistance programs that we've been able to do in, in the state level for the last several sessions and with inflation that, that increase has also been uh, been taken away because of that I mean, real dollars going out to our families. So the fact that the food prices are increasing, losing SNAP benefits, and, and now in addition to that, other federal programs that are also coming off Lifeline and, and the pandemic era programs that they believe now should be taken away because in their mind, the pandemic is over, which is actually not where in actually in worse shape than we are now in many of these situations. Um, this is really a time where state government, which we're happy that in the sub budget, we're probably gonna get to in, in a minute, the sub budget is actually you know putting some money in there the governor and the Senate and the House have all agreed that it's time to uh, put some money there to alleviate the effects of the cliff effect of this all coming to, a, to a, an end suddenly and easing off of the benefit. So my hope is also to increase other programs to help our families that need help the most as well. So this is a one step approach now, but it's a more holistic approach. Where we have to, to talk about universal school meals, talk about cash assistance programs, 
uh, and get more people on SNAP. Honestly, this is, it's a federal program that will leave money on the table if we don't access that money. Yeah, and I want to ask you about that supplemental budget. But, but first, as you said, it, I think it's important to clarify. People are not losing SNAP benefits. It's a reduction in the amount that many households are receiving. Um, at this expansion happened at, a, at a, a remarkable time in our history and when you know people were dealing with all kinds of stresses from the pandemic. And as you said, of course, we're not done with COVID, right? But we're not in the same place that we were when the expansion happened. And you know, could an argument be made, uh, or should an argument be made, that the expansion is, is no longer as necessary as it once was? I'd, I'd love to answer this question. I think um, that when we look at when that was implemented, yes, we were in crisis mode, that's, that's for sure. Um, but there should be some consideration in terms of what the economic climate looks like when we're making these types of decisions and removing um, benefits because we're in a very different state we are in March 2023 than we were in March 2020. So, um, you know, cost of food, I mean, it's not just cost of food. It, it, that is definitely a driving force, but as Senator Domenico said, it is a perfect storm because the affordability of everything is up right now. Um, and so I think when we think about taking away benefits, we have to really look at holistically, um, how are we really positioning people to thrive and really get on their feet and recover uh, into an economy that we want to see um, for the future? Senator DiDomenico, about that supplemental budget, the, the governor uh, has proposed $130 million to uh, go to SNAP benefits to help those families. Not, But it's not indefinitely. It's only for three months, and it would cover 40% of the amount that's being lost, right? I, I know the, the House unanimously, I think, approved that supplemental budget. I think is the, the Senate is expected to take that up this week, if I'm not mistaken. Do you expect that to pass, and, and what difference would that make? I do expect it to pass. We're taking it up on Thursday. Uh, this has been a program that the Senate has historically been supportive of, and uh, Obviously, the, the governor saw the need, the House members saw the need, and the Senate sees the need. So uh, we're all in agreement that we have to do something here to alleviate the effects of, of what is happening here, to take away a benefit from somebody who is uh, relying on that. That, that is, that is a, a very difficult thing for families to, to, to counteract, right? So the, the dependency on these, because of the situation that they're in and the circumstances of what's happening now, I would argue that families are in worse shape than they were prior to the pandemic because they had to go through the pandemic and now trying to recover and make up ground from where they left off has put them in a deeper hole than they were prior to the pandemic beginning. And, and now, so we're in a situation where we could either let this happen and let this, this expire, this increased amount and snap, or we can do something about it to alleviate the effect of it and try to minimize the impact over time. And um, it's my hope, obviously, that we do other things and, you know, as going forward as a legislature to, to counteract this and to bring more, more resources to the families that are represented, particularly families like Everett and Chelsea and gateway communities that are still trying to find their way after, you know, to experience tremendous loss, not just financially, but also personally, you know, for their own families and putting themselves in, in a position where um, they had no, through no fault of their own, they had uh, no way out. And, you know, SNAP was really, a, a, is one of those programs that that we could rely on and the, the, the benefit now expiring, the additional benefit expiring is really a hit to a lot of families and we have to find a way to make that up. Catherine, you touched on this before, but what do you expect the impact of this change in benefits to be on food banks and, and what's your ability to meet any increased demand? Well, a, a couple of things. I, so so w one thing that I, I know, um, because we've seen it in his history, um, when we have a crisis, it takes a long time for the demand from that crisis to go away. So when we um, were looking at um, right before the pandemic, it, it we were just recovering from pre-pandemic, uh, or I'm sorry, pre-recession, 2008 recession numbers. And so it took us almost 10 years to claw back to a place where we were 
at, you know, one in eight, one in nine. We're now seeing one in three people are food insecure. So I think there has to be a, a reality, a recognition that it takes time. As Senator Didi was saying, there's been a lot of loss, a lot of hurt financially um, and economically, and it will take a long time. So we know this and we're seeing it reflected in the numbers that we're serving right now. So we saw a 60% increase to the amount of people served um, in the pandemic, and that's been constant. Um, we've seen this chronic need. And so when you take away a, a significant um, takeaway of benefits that uh, people have been relying on in some ways, almost keeping them from relying on the food pantries even more, um, we know that they're going to turn to us. They're going to need more help. So um, we are worried. I think that that's why there needs to be this holistic conversation. We need to talk about affordability here in Massachusetts and what it really means to support people um, holistically. And uh, I'm really, really pleased that the um, the governor filed, filed this supplemental budget and the legislature is taking it up. And my hope is that we'll just continue to have conversations about how we can support people in the short and the long term. Yeah, that supplemental budget does not include any increased funding for food banks like yours to help people who uh, maybe need to rely on food banks more. Is it your hope that the state legislature might step up and, and provides additional support for your programs? Yeah, we're having those conversations. And, you know, we've been really fortunate that the legislature has stepped, stepped up time and time again to support the food bank network. And we're really grateful for that. And, um, you know, we're in just about to go into a FY24 budget um, conversation. So we'll have, we'll continue to cover, you know, having conversations. I know, I, I have Senator Dina Menifes phone number. <laughs> All right. All right. Yeah, I mean, when we look at the number of people who receive SNAP benefits, you know, as we said, it was about 640,000 households or a million residents of Massachusetts are getting food through SNAP benefits. By my rough math, that's roughly one in seven people in Massachusetts. I think you touched on this a moment ago, but I think it raises larger questions about food insecurity in, in the state. And beyond just the benefits, why this many people need assistance getting fed. Catherine, can you just sort of address that briefly? Yeah, we live in a very expensive region in, in the state and in the country. Um, I think that that's, that's a, a big, and, and these are complex issues. Um, you know, there's not one silver bullet, I think that's gonna solve this. I think that there's, um, I'm really pleased to see that there's recognition of the intersectionality of some of these issues between housing and transportation and hunger and medical costs and childcare and college affordability. All of these things are contributing factors to why an individual or a family is not being able to afford food right now. So I think we need to continue to think about that and think about, think in that way that, so that we can long-term really address the root causes of of hunger because um, it is an economic and it's a political condition. All right. State Senator, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, and, and, and you know, and also, um, if you can believe in, in our state, which is uh, considered a wealthy state and a wealthy country, uh, we have many people living below the, the, the deep poverty level, which is 50% below poverty level, uh, which you can't even imagine that's a case in our state. Um, so we have been able to uh, tackle food insecurity in, in a three or four prong approach here with providing more cash assistance to our families, to increasing SNAP benefits eligibility and you know, trying to find people who are eligible for mass help that are also eligible for SNAP benefits. So they don't have to go to two different places to apply for the benefits and universal school meals, which is really getting a lot of, a lot of traction across the country and on the, within our state in particular, um, when the federal program would stop for that too. The state picked up the difference and to the tune of $130 million. And now the governor put in her sup out of $65 million to cover mm -hmm. the difference, which shows that kids are eating in our schools more than ever. Um, you know, when people that want to go back to the old way of filling out farms and trying to find a way to uh, do a means test on food, that's when we get in trouble. 
yeah. because you can't put a means test on food when 25% of the students that don't qualify for food reduced lunch are food insecure within themselves and their own families. And in addition to that, the stigma attached to filling out forms. People don't want to sign documents. So it really is an issue that we can't solve with one approach. We have to you know, do a multi-approach you know, and tackle this, as, as was said, a holistic approach. And Okay. We're working on that in the Senate and legislature as well. Okay, well, State Senator Sal DiDomenico and Catherine Lynn of the Greater Boston Food Bank, thank you both so much for joining us tonight. Next up, what does it mean for food to be healthy? The answer to that question surely differs from person to person, but the Food and Drug Administration has had rules in place for years about what foods are legally allowed to don that label. And now they're looking to raise the standards for what it means to be healthy. Past regulations included limits on saturated fat, cholesterol, and sodium, but now the agency is looking to impose stricter limits on those categories and a new limits on sugar, too. The new rules would also require products include a certain amount of recommended food groups, like fruits and vegetables, in order to be labeled healthy in an effort to encourage eating more nutrient-dense foods. The proposed rule change comes in response to the latest set of federal dietary guidelines, which urge Americans to look at their diet holistically to make sure they're eating a wide variety of nutrients. But companies and trade groups from across the food production industry are pushing back, including the Consumer Brands Association, which represents Coca-Cola and PepsiCo, among other companies, and argues the new rules, quote, could harm both the consumer and the manufacturer, unquote. Joining me to discuss are registered dietitian nutritionist Lauren Maneker and reporter Nicholas Florco, who covers the commercial determinants of health for Stat News. Thank you both for joining us. So, Nick, can we just start with you? How did the FDA propose updating the definition of healthy? Well, it's, it's essentially the same process they'd go through to regulate sort of any any industry. They put out a proposal. Uh, it's usually quite detailed. They get comments from industry and from the public, which they're currently going through. And then they decide if they're going to finalize the rule. I think an important thing to note here is that this whole process was actually set off by the granola company, a uh, granola bar company, Kind, who petitioned the FDA quite a few years back now because they got uh, a warning letter from the FDA disciplinary letter basically saying, you're calling your foods healthy, we don't think they are, and kind urged them to update that uh, that rule, and that's what they're doing now. Uh, yeah, it's funny that it's it's kind bar of all things, because, you know, I, I like kind bar just as much as anybody else, but, you know, the ones that I have are covered in chocolate. I, they're not exactly what I would consider to be healthy. Yeah, the interesting thing is that KIND actually is raising concerns now with the new definition. They got one of the things they wanted, which was essentially looser restrictions on saturated fat and nuts. But the FDA actually came back and said, you can't add sugar to nuts. And so when you have something like chocolate covered almonds, you obviously have problems. Yeah. Um, how is the term used by brands? Are we talking about being able to say the word healthy in advertising, on the packaging? Like, where is this an issue? So it is a marketing, it's used primarily in marketing, but I think it's important to level set here, which is that the FDA isn't saying that healthy foods can't be sold or that they have, or that brands have to warn consumers when a product isn't healthy, which by the way, they actually do have to do in some other countries. Um, this essentially is just saying, if you don't meet these restrictions, you know, you can't call your food healthy on its label or uh, in its advertising. Uh, but I will say, you know, that's a pretty big deal for companies that have staked their reputation on being healthy. I mean, think about Healthy Choice, for example. If Healthy Choice can't call its food healthy, that creates a really big marketing problem for them. Yeah. Lauren, I mean, th these new regulations don't uh, b ban foods that are unhealthy, certainly. Um, how much of a difference does this make in terms of consumer behavior? I mean, are people really making decisions about their food based on the use of a word like healthy? You know, I think it depends on the person. I think it can for some, and I think it can't for others. You know, I think what people need to recognize, which is um, you touched on earlier, is that if you don't see the word healthy, it doesn't mean it's unhealthy, you know, every single person has different nutrition needs. It just doesn't check all the boxes to be able to have that claim, which is nice having regulations around a claim because there's so many other marketing terms like clean. There, there's no definition for the word clean when it comes to food. So from my perspective, I, I appreciate having a set guideline to refer to. Do you feel that food companies have been 
inaccurately using the word healthy? Are there things that are being labeled healthy that you don't feel should be? You know, I think that they were complying with the old guidelines. I think we've learned a lot in the nutrition world since 1994, which is when the first term, the first definition for healthy came out. You know, before we were not eating avocados and walnuts because they're high in fat. Now we know they have certain fats that we need. So now avocados are going to be allowed to be called healthy, whereas from my understanding, they weren't before. And we all know that they're a fantastic part of a healthy diet. So... I don't think that they were wrong. I think they were just complying with what the guidelines said that they can use at the time. You know, these regulations were proposed back in September, right? But Nick, your reporting included the fact that the companies are, are really pushing back now. What, what are they saying? What are the, some of the company's uh, critiques of these new regulations? Yeah, there, there's pretty vociferous pushback. I mean, the most common one is quite frankly just that um, food manufacturers say these uh, these rules are unachievable, that essentially a lot of the foods that they offer, they won't be able to, they, they couldn't be labeled as healthy anymore. They couldn't innovate to create healthier foods because no one would eat them because they don't taste good. Um, but probably the, the more salient um, uh, objection to this, which is worth noting, is that a number of groups are already raising concerns, legal concerns about this, and sort of vaguely threatening to sue um, and saying that this could actually violate food manufacturers' First Amendment rights. Uh, and so my guess is that if this gets finalized, if the FDA sticks to its guns and says, we're moving forward with this, this is definitely going to end up in a courtroom. Yeah, it was interesting to me that the First Amendment was what the issue was here, right? That it, it actually, the argument was their uh, ability to say that their food is healthy is infringed, their First Amendment right here. It's not just about nutrition guidelines, it's about freedom of speech. Yeah, I mean, so basically they argue that, you know, if they have a legitimate scientific basis to say their food is healthy, that the government can't keep them from, uh, you know, disseminating that truthful and non-misleading speech. So, you know, it, it's really a question of whether the FDA's restrictions are so um, so stringent that uh, it's preventing companies from, you know, being able to say a food is healthy when you can make an argument that in fact it is. Well, one of the, the food groups, the associations, the National Pasta Association, their argument was that uh, pasta is healthy because people who eat pasta tend to have better diets, including more vegetables, which like, to me seems like you're, you're conflating, you know, it, it's causation and correlation here. Just because someone who eats pasta also eats vegetables doesn't make pasta healthy. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of very interesting arguments uh, being offered for why different food groups are healthy. Um, one of my other favorites was uh, the pickle lobby and Pickle Packers International, who said, you know, their products aren't healthy uh, under the FDA's rules because there's too much salt, but they're predominantly comprised of vegetables. And they said, quote, they serve as a delicious condiment to other nutrient dense foods. Um, so, you know, we're getting a lot of interesting arguments here, but honestly, I think the more telling thing is the amount of companies in the U.S. that people think of as healthy and making healthy foods that wouldn't be considered healthy under this regulation. And, and companies have been openly admitting, you know, a lot of our foods wouldn't be healthy. And that, to me, tells us a lot about our eating habits. Yeah, they are a delicious condiment. Whether or not they're healthy is, is another question entirely. You know, you mentioned the Healthy Choice brand in particular, which is made by ConAgra. And they said that they couldn't actually continue to even call their product Healthy Choice based on these new guidelines. And Lauren, I wanted to ask you, I mean, I think that says more about, you know, why they feel like they can't continue to make this product without all of that added salt and sugar. I mean, are consumers so programmed to expect salty foods that they really wouldn't choose these brands if they didn't have all that added salt? I think not adding the salt is certainly going to affect the flavor of the product. I, there are other solutions that these companies can use, but that means they have to go back to innovation. They have to invest the money. They have to invest the time. They have to redo the packaging if they're changing the ingredients. So it is a big undertaking and, you know, saying you have a food choice where in the label it says healthy, most people aren't taking the time to read every food label to determine how much sodium is in their product. They're assuming it's healthy. So by taking away the sodium, it would affect the taste and people would then 
maybe not want to purchase it as much as they would, or maybe they would. I mean, there's a lot of speculation going on here too. We don't know until we try it out. Yeah, I mean, other countries actually go a lot further in limiting uh, or regulating how, what can actually go in foods than we do, right? I mean, is there, is there an argument to be made for, uh, for that? At this point, I, I don't believe there is. I, from what I understand, some food companies are arguing that if they're limiting the added sugar that they could put in their food, all that's going to do is encourage food companies to then use the sugar alternatives. So they're going to find a workaround and then adding more of those additives and artificial flavorings, which, you know, who knows if that's a better choice. Um, really, I feel that the FDA is trying to tackle all of these health issues that we have in the United States. I don't think they're coming from a bad place. I think they're trying to stay along the lines of what we've learned over the past few years and how nutrition has changed. And the ultimate goal is to keep Americans healthy. Okay. I mean, you know, the, the uh, Consumer Brands Association said that 95% of foods on the market right now would not qualify as healthy under these new regulations. And it, to me, it, maybe it suggests something more about the nature of the food being sold to us than it does about the definition of the word healthy. Can, Lauren, can you, can you speak at all about that, about what it tells us about what we are eating as a society and what is that doing for our health? You know, I would imagine that these foods are, a lot of them are ultra processed foods and they don't have the balance of the macro and micronutrients that produce and dairy and a lot of these other foods have to offer. I, I think, I understand where they're coming from. I mean, their job is to sell product and they don't want anything to get in the way of giving the message that people want to hear. But I think we're getting kind of lost in the weeds here because there are foods that can be labeled as healthy according to the FDA definition. There are other foods like a kind bar, which maybe we can't call healthy, but they do have a lot of nutrients in them. Yes, they have added sugar. If you are eating that as part of an overall balanced healthy diet that ultimately is lower in sugar, you can still have it. So yes, a lot of the foods on our um, shelves may not be the definition of healthy, but that doesn't mean that we can't still eat them. We just have to look at the big picture of what we're eating. We don't eat in a vacuum. Like we're not just eating the kind bars and that's it. So your advice would be, uh, you know, have your kind bar maybe, but uh, make sure you're also getting lots of fruits and vegetables. That's exactly it. You know, and I, I, from my understanding, the ultimate goal is to really focus on the dietary patterns and not get stuck on looking at the individual foods as well. You know, saying something is healthy, to me, it's still a subjective word. And we're going off of what the FDA is deeming the definition to be. But what's healthy for me may not be healthy for someone who's managing diabetes and they don't have functioning kidneys. So I, I don't think that we should really get stuck on the definition. I think it may be more of a concern for um, food brands that can't continue to give messages that they have always been able to say. Okay, well, Laura Menneker and Nick Florco, thank you so much for joining us today. That's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Good night. Next time at 11.30.